Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight, Justin Trudeau responds to the Meng Wanzhou case. Our top priority is the safe return of the two Michaels. As news swirls, we've got the view from Ottawa and Beijing. These four groups of people should be covered by the initial doses. More clarity on who should get the vaccine first. So when uh, COVID hit, homes were not prepared. A rebuke for Ontario's government on long-term care homes and a call to bring back cancelled inspections. And dancing, even if nobody's watching. We're going to perform that people should feel that life is going on. From Moscow to Toronto, ballet takes the stage. This is The National. Are Michael Spaver and Michael Kovrig, the two Canadians being held in China under severe conditions, any closer to getting their freedom? Fresh hopes were raised last night by reports that talks are underway between the U.S. Department of Justice and Meng Wanzhou. She's the Huawei executive arrested in Vancouver two years ago, wanted in the U.S. on fraud charges. China's arrests of the Michaels came just days later. David Cochran starts our coverage with the very cautious words from the Prime Minister. Canadians know well that our top priority is the safe return of the two Michaels. Whatever is happening behind the scenes, the public messaging isn't changing. We've been working uh, extremely hard uh, to bring home these two Michaels. Uh, it is an absolute priority for the government. Um, I won't be commenting on any of the recent reports. Trudeau reluctant to say anything that could endanger Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver, or say anything that Meng Wanzhou's legal team could use in the extradition case. China's foreign ministry repeated its call for Meng's release, saying her detention is part of a U.S. attempt to punish Chinese tech companies. But diplomatic experts warn that even if Meng cuts a deal, there's no guarantee the Michaels will be set free. It's not automatic that they will come back, but uh, I'm pretty sure that there are discussions taking place uh, right now between the Canadian embassy in Beijing and uh, Chinese authorities to try to come up with uh, an arrangement. The worst possible outcome for Canada would be for the U.S. to cut a deal that sends Meng back to China without the Michaels coming back to Canada. Well, then I think the Trudeau government's going to look... Uh, like chumps, you know, that we've, we've been used by the Americans and consistently abused by the Chinese. So I think Mr. Trudeau has got to put a tremendous amount of pressure on both the Trump administration and incoming Biden administration to make sure that there is an explicit link. Meng remains under house arrest in her Vancouver mansion, the two Michaels in a Chinese prison. Next week, a grim anniversary, two years since the two Michaels were detained by the Chinese government. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Our Asia correspondent, Sasha Petrasik, is in Beijing. And Sasha, based on past history with China, where would this leave the Michaels? Well, Ian, the last time Canada was in a similar situation with China was uh, five or six years ago. It involved a Canadian couple, Kevin and Julia Garrett, and a similar extradition request from the United States. The Garretts were missionaries who were running a cafe in northeast China when one day they were arrested for espionage after the extradition case started. Now, one thing to note is that even that after that case was resolved, even after there was no more extradition hearings or anything else, it took another more than six months before both of the Garretts were back in Canada and free. And China never really acknowledged the connection between the two cases. And so a lot of parallels between what happened then and what is happening now. That's right. In this case also, there is no acknowledgement from Beijing here that uh, there's any connection between uh, the Michaels and Meng Wanzhou in Vancouver. So it will be up to Ottawa to really negotiate that, to make the connection and to uh, try to make China actually uh, commit themselves to release the Michaels if Meng Wanzhou comes back to China. One thing to note, though, is that even though this other case was only five or six years ago, the Garretts, um, China is a very different country when it comes to diplomacy. It is much tougher. It is conducting what's being called wolf warrior diplomacy. And uh, it might not be in the mood to negotiate this sort of thing. So it could be a while before the Michaels actually make it back, no matter what happens with Meng.
wolf warrior diplomacy. Interesting, Sasha, thank you. My pleasure, Ian. Let's turn to the COVID-19 story now, where Canada has passed yet another milestone. More than 402,000 people have tested positive, a gain of 100,000 in just 18 days. And this comes as the Canadian Armed Forces began drills in preparation for distributing the vaccine. Freezers have been purchased and dry ice contracts for cold shipping are being put in place. When vaccines get authorized and shipped, we'll be ready. The Prime Minister reiterated that Ottawa is working with provinces and territories when it comes to rolling out vaccines. Those first doses are supposed to arrive next month. As for who might get them first, well, Canada's top public health doctor talked about that today. Here's Christine Burak. Canada is expecting 6 million doses of leading COVID-19 vaccines to arrive between January and March. That's enough to vaccinate 3 million Canadians. As for who should get those doses, experts have been recommending seniors in care homes, followed by adults over 70, healthcare workers and vulnerable Indigenous communities. Canada's top doctor now says that's well within reach. As a ballpark, these four groups of people as things are rolled out, should be covered by the initial doses. Come April, if all goes to plan, officials say millions of additional doses will continue rolling in for other Canadians. In some ways, it's quite seamless. Like we just continue vaccinating all these groups, and so we'll have enough for everyone. But experts say a lot depends on how many doses each province or territory receives and when. Health Canada hasn't said whether vaccines will be handed out based on population or need. Right now, Manitoba and Alberta have the highest rate of active cases. It's not clear whether those provinces would get priority over larger ones like Ontario and Quebec. I can tell you those conversations have been extremely collaborative. Provinces ultimately decide who gets which vaccine and when. After priority groups, experts say essential workers, including grocery store clerks, teachers and truck drivers, should be next. No doubt, many Canadians are wondering where in line they might be for a shot. I tend to be somewhat cautiously optimistic that by summer, um, you know, we, we could see you know, regular people in the public being vaccinated widely. Others are less optimistic. Honestly, I see those people getting those vaccines next fall. Uh, I don't see them getting them this spring. But again, like, I don't know how much we're getting. But a clearer picture of who might get those precious vaccines first is starting to come into focus. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. And Ottawa says it's updated its deal with Moderna to secure an additional 20 million doses of its vaccine for next year. The procurement minister, Anita Anand, says Moderna will now supply 40 million doses to Canadians in 2021. A contract with FedEx was also announced to handle the shipment of most vaccines within the country. Ontario has announced the nine members of its vaccine task force to be led by former Chief of Defence Staff Rick Hillier. It will oversee vaccine delivery, storage and distribution. Today, the province reported 1,780 new cases and put tighter restrictions on three regions. But today, the government was told it needs to do something else and quickly. Ontario's Independent Commission for Long-Term Care wants a return to unannounced inspections of homes. David Common shows us how the government played down the need for those inspections after cancelling them. Until they were cancelled by the Ford government, inspectors like this one would surprise visit care homes in search of problems before they had consequences. The government's own panel now says those inspections should resume and soon. That is a red herring. Back in May, though, the government downplayed the importance of the proactive inspections after CBC News revealed they'd been stopped. The inspections being the cause of this, um, it's not accurate. But the commission says the inspections absolutely were needed, leaving the government with an incomplete picture of the state of infection prevention and control and emergency preparedness inside homes. In the year before COVID, just 27 homes had a comprehensive inspection, down from 329 the year before. So when uh, COVID hit, homes were not prepared. Jane Medes is a seniors advocate. Well, the cost of that, I think, has been uh, more deaths. 
The government panel also takes aim at what it calls a lack of enforcement. When government inspectors have found problems, told a long-term care home to fix things, there hasn't been follow-up verification to see if there's been compliance. In other words, problems identified have been left instead to fester. We met a former inspector in the fall who told us it's a well-known problem. How many times would you write in a report, I found this problem and go back into the same home the next year and find that same issue? Yeah, many times. That seems like a problem. The system's broken. As COVID outbreaks increase inside homes, once again, the Commission says those homes need help to improve infection control. The government says it's hired more inspectors and defends shifting to what it calls risk-based inspections, responding after there is a complaint or critical incident. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. In Manitoba, nine more people have died of COVID-19. Across the province, there are 320 new cases and a record 361 patients in hospital. Then there's Shamatawa First Nation, where at least 130 people are infected. As Cameron McIntosh tells us, the chief says the community is at the breaking point. Tucked away in Manitoba's far north, Shamatawa's isolation once protected it. Now it's working against it. Residents literally trying to hide behind closed doors as the COVID test positivity rate approaches 70%. We're losing people by the hour. Chief Eric Redhead says 130 people, more than one in 10, are sick. With more each day, the community is overwhelmed. He's asking for a military field hospital. I didn't get a firm uh, answer from the, from the minister. Basically, the minister says, uh, you know, he, he hopes to know soon. That's what Mark Miller also told the House of Commons. We'll remain in active communication with the community and stand ready to provide additional support. Ottawa has sent a medical tent, but no way to heat it in December. A small medical response team is on the ground. One of those people may have actually caught COVID. The Red Cross has sent cots. It's sending people next week. This time of year, the community is fly-in only. And complicating and adding to the urgency, Shamatawa was already fighting an epidemic of tuberculosis making many here more susceptible, say response team doctors. We're always also dealing with these overlapping historic and current socioeconomic conditions that Indigenous people experience. One of those is overcrowding. And the houses, everybody's overcrowded here. And that's why it's spreading so fast. Sherry Schweder lives in a house with 11 other people, all trying to stay apart. When I go home, I go straight to my room. I haven't had any contact with my children. Redhead says the community is at the breaking point. I don't know how much, how much more time we have before basically the entire community is infected with this. As more people get sick, the community is trying to send more people out in a province already struggling with full ICUs and one of the worst infection rates in the country. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Alberta has now recorded its highest test positivity rate since the beginning of the pandemic. Our provincial positivity rate has risen to 10.5% and we now have 18,243 active cases. This positivity rate is a grim milestone and one that should concern us all. And the province saw 1,828 new cases today, its second highest number to date. Here in British Columbia, officials continue to deal with a high number of cases and there's particular concern with a spike in smaller communities where there are fewer resources to fight the pandemic. Health officials today reporting more than 700 cases, 81 of those in the less densely populated interior of the province. Greg Rasmussen has more from a ski town worried about an avalanche of infections. Usually it's a busy winter playground, but now a COVID surge has the mayor of Revelstoke pleading for people to stay away after seven cases were traced to recreational travelers. My blunt message is if it's not essential travel, don't come here. Uh, essential travel doesn't mean that, geez, I've got a ski pass and I've got to use it or I need to be snowmobiling this weekend. Despite the request, outside visitors continue to arrive, shown by the out-of-province plates at the local ski hill. Just having to be secluded by yourself for so long is, is pretty stressful. 
This cafe manager was one of those who caught the virus, along with two co-workers. It kind of felt like chaos all of a sudden, that it, it was real and it's in our town. Cases in Revelstoke went from zero during the summer to 22 in late November, surging to 49 this week. That's one in 200 residents infected. People flocked to this testing site while doctors worried. For a small 10-bed hospital, we don't have an ICU. Uh, there's only two respirators in this hospital, and one of them needs to be reserved for emergency surgeries. Revelstoke wasn't publicly identified as a cluster until 22 people tested positive because BC health officials don't publish daily caseloads for small communities. In a small community like ours, it spreads like wildfire. This city councillor wants more data more quickly. If we had heard ahead of time that, hey, there was one, two or three, you know, we could have let the business community know this is what's going on, prep the health sector a little bit better. On the upside, once those numbers were public, people took action. What happened last Saturday was everybody got worried. Everybody started wearing masks. Everybody started listening. Everybody started saying, oh man, this is real. She says it's been a scary lesson for Revelstoke and other small towns should pay attention. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. New evidence today of the pandemic's continued impact on the economy. November job numbers from Statistics Canada show an increase of 62,000 new jobs, but that was a drop from the 84,000 created in October. The jobless rate fell to 8.5%. Canada's seventh largest bank is going where none of its larger competitors have gone before. HSBC is offering a mortgage rate of less than 1%. Peter Armstrong looks at a COVID-related trend in those rates and why it's being considered troubling. Built-in vanity with storage. There's nothing normal about buying a house right now. Online tours have replaced open houses. So is it any surprise that the mortgage market is turning heads too? Since the pandemic hit, it's been a, a wild time in the Canadian mortgage market. The Bank of Canada started the wild times off by slashing interest rates to record lows, hoping that would stimulate economic activity. And while everything else shut down, real estate activity has been off the charts. People's lives have been altered dramatically. The most obvious example is they're working from home. Uh, so that's caused them to uh, have a different appetite for the type of housing situation that they, they desire. People are leaving condos and buying houses. They're trading one house for something bigger and trading the city for the suburbs. This is a sign that the economy is still in rough shape. Because make no mistake, interest rates this low don't happen when things are looking good. They come because the economy is in crisis. We'd be much happier to have an economy that included decent contributions from tourism, hospitality, restaurants, and, ex and more on exports. The drop in interest rates is yet another sign of the two-tiered recovery. Millions of Canadians lost their jobs when the pandemic hit. Many of them continue to struggle but millions more simply adjusted to working from home. They are the target of ultra low interest rates and the banks know those borrowers need to pass a stress test to qualify. So the risk of offering such low rates is low. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. Pandemic life needs a fast online connection. And while people in rural and remote areas wait for Ottawa to get them up to speed, Elon Musk's new internet satellite service is already beaming down into Canada. Thomas Dagla has the details. All right, let's dig in. For some people, it's a dream in a box. The promise of blazing fast internet from that dish. And for Greg Rakunis in New Brunswick, the dream just came true. I've been waiting for something like this for a long time. He's among a select group of rural Canadians chosen to test Starlink satellite internet at home. Rakunas lives on a picturesque peninsula, accessible by ferry, but hardly hooked up to high-speed internet. It's a game changer for everybody in this area. Everybody's very excited about this technology. They're really looking forward to it. Ignition, turn with Their solution is coming from above. U.S. aerospace firm SpaceX has already sent hundreds of satellites into low orbit. Those 60 Starlink satellites gently floating away. To beam the internet back to Earth. Founder Elon Musk is pledging to connect the entire world. 
even Canada's most remote areas like Pekanjikum in northwest Ontario, the first Indigenous community to get Starlink. It's doing everything that people are asking it to do. Um, and, and, you know, bang for your buck, it's, it's a wonderful thing. It's going gonna, it's gonna to change the world. With help from SpaceX, David Brown's firm has so far connected some 60 businesses and homes on the Ojibwe First Nation. Though with a cost of $649 plus tax for the equipment than $129 a month, Starlink will be out of reach for many Canadians. Plus, some are already spotting those satellites at night with thousands more coming and that's causing concern from stargazers. For a couple of hours after sunset and a couple of hours before sunrise, from a lot of places you will see more satellites in the sky than stars. Starlink is planning a global expansion in the new year, bringing the future to homes well beyond rural Canada. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. The start of Nova Scotia's lobster season was delayed in one fishing area this week. It's probably one of the most dangerous days of the season. Up next, how bad weather and the pandemic are adding to tensions. Plus, we check in on Canadian seniors. I have one friend, and he's 94 years old. Well, he doesn't want to come here now because of the COVID. Battling loneliness and uncertainty. What doctors are prescribing ahead of a long winter. And the show must go on. It's a very difficult time for everybody, especially for ballet dancer. Inside Moscow's Bolshoi Theatre, we're back in two. In parts of Nova Scotia, the last Monday of November is the traditional start of the commercial lobster fishing season. They call it dumping day for all the traps that get dropped in the ocean. But in one fishing zone, dangerous weather has delayed the dumping and that only adds to an already strained situation. It's not just COVID-19. Kayla Hounsel shows us the uneasy standoff between two groups of fishermen. This crew has been getting ready all week. Dumping day has been delayed again and again due to high winds. There's always a nervous energy. It's probably one of the most dangerous days of the season because uh, all the boats are loaded with gear and uh, most of these boats have 375 pots aboard. So boats are, uh, you know, top heavy. This year there are new tensions as well. They fish near Sonyeville, where the Sebeginegadi First Nation launched a self-regulated fishery in September. Commercial fishermen pulled Mi'kmaq traps, citing conservation concerns. They raided their lobster, released them, and vandalized vehicles. Now they say they're being provoked on their own wharf by an indigenous man loudly playing traditional music. You know, there was numerous threats that uh, our gear is going to get caught as soon as we dump it, and there was threats that... Uh, uh, you know, our, uh, our words are going to be blocked off. This Mi'kmaq fisher says she doesn't want anyone to cause trouble. I hope and pray that they don't and everything, like I said, it's going to, everybody's going to be safe and everybody, you know, respects everybody's stuff. And that tension within the industry isn't the only thing that's different this year. There's also concern about the coronavirus and its potential impact on lobster sales. We are swimming in a sea of uncertainty. That Stuart Lamont exports lobster to 21 countries. He says because of the timing of peak selling seasons, the second wave is even more concerning than the first. Last year we had already completed Christmas and New Year sales. We had already completed Chinese New Year sales. This year all that is in front of us, so we have much greater uncertainty. With so much at stake, Bukowski says fishers shouldn't be working against one another. It's out of our control and it's out of our hands. We just got to go fishing and uh, bring in our catch. And, uh, He's hoping dumping day, whenever it happens, unfolds as safely as possible. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Metagan, Nova Scotia. When we come back, what life looks like for seniors living alone. The toll of pandemic isolation on their mental health. And finding ways to address that loneliness. Our panel of doctors is here with some tips for seniors. The pandemic has meant that many seniors living alone are feeling more isolated than ever. In many cases, they can't have visitors, they can't take part in the activities they're used to. 
Briar Stewart shows us some efforts to reach them. This is my apartment. It's all my knitting. This is where 82-year-old Georgiana Del Casino has been spending all of her days. This is going into the garden, to looking into the garden. Visitors can't come in and she can't be with her neighbors because the long-term care facility attached to her building has an outbreak of COVID-19. You know, I have one friend and he's 94 years old. Well, he doesn't want to come here now because of the COVID. He doesn't want to be in contact with me. So that is really difficult. Even before the pandemic, research showed that as many as 50% of Canadians over 80 reported feeling lonely. But now the sense of isolation is heightened. What we're hearing from seniors in the community at this time is that, that uh, they, they almost feel forgotten, actually. Suzanne Dupuy Blanchard is working on a study surveying seniors who live on their own. She says while well, winter is normally a tough time, with rising case numbers and restrictions, this year will be particularly difficult. So in this one we have eggs, we have pasta. This food hamper program is one of the only things the Chilliwack Seniors Resource Society has running right now, as most of their classes and activities, which were just restarted, had to be cancelled again. A lot of our seniors are widowed and a lot of our seniors live alone, so that's their only source of connection, doing a walking group, doing a reading group, you know, having an activity together. So they want to be doing things. So now this organization, like others, is trying to pivot by putting more programming online. But they admit not all seniors are comfortable with technology, so they're also reaching out through phone calls. At the beginning of the pandemic, social service agencies put out a call for volunteers to help those who were stuck at home. The response was great, and so was the need. In the first six months, we provided close to 400,000 services, which is double our annual amount in six months. And that was just in B.C. The United Way says the biggest demand was for groceries and meal delivery, as well as phone calls. Yeah, we get into quite some conversations. Del Casino gets one of those every morning and says it's the bright spot of her day. Sure, it's nice to get a phone call, but it's not the same. It's not the same as seeing them and walking with them and, you know, and I'm sure I'm not the only one that's in that situation. Feeling lonely and knowing that most of the next few months will be spent in her apartment by herself. Briar Stewart, CBC News, New Westminster, B.C. So to talk more about this issue and what can be done to ease loneliness, we're joined by Dr. Samir Sinha, Director of Geriatrics at Sinai Health System in Toronto, and Dr. Raymond Abdul-Rahman, a clinical psychologist in Winnipeg. And Dr. Sinha, let me begin with you. As you listen to that story, uh, what comes to mind? Yeah, I, this is a common scenario that I'm seeing with a lot of my older patients. Uh, a lot of older adults are just struggling with the isolation. And we did an, a study over the summer that showed 67% of them are finding that that lack of connection to other people is really affecting their health and well-being. And Dr. Abdul Rahman? Well, the interesting thing is uh, the research shows is that generally older adults tend to do better when it comes to some other areas when it comes to mental health. Difficulties with depression and loneliness have been a problem even prior to COVID. And with COVID, actually, the rates of, uh, of depression have actually, actually elevated. And what we're finding now, the research shows in care homes, is that it's quadrupled. So I'll ask this to each of you. Uh, first of all, you, Dr. Abdul Rahman, what do we do about it? Those of us who have relatives or friends who are seniors who are living alone or maybe in care homes, what do we do? Well, I think the short answer is call your mother. Uh, and your father. Um, what, what we need to know about mental health to answer this question is that, and particularly about depression, is yes, there might be a genetic component, but our social circumstances greatly influence our mood and our depression. Um, and if we're not making efforts to contact, uh, have contact with these older adults, particularly those that are more isolated, they're more likely to be susceptible to difficulties with isolation and depression. So the first thing we need to be doing is having more regular contact. Many times people wait for greater opportunities for time to contact uh, members of the family that are older. I would say even if it's a brief contact but more regular, that'll do a lot more service. Um, you know, find ways to keep uh, yourself engaged if you're an older adult or if you've got a family member who's that, so that, you know, your brain is a bit more active. And lastly, you know, have some sense of purpose or responsibility. And so there's research that also talks about, you know, uh, older adults in care homes who had a plant uh, to care for 
lived longer than those who didn't. So this sense of responsibility and purpose has a great deal of impact as well, too. That's positive. Dr. Sinha? No, exactly. And I think this is where we have to focus on encouraging, you know, older adults. I do this with my patients in my practice and their families is to really figure out, you know, kind of what brings them joy, um, what helps them stay connected to others. And and there are ways about helping people stay connected. So if you think about people in care homes, for example, uh, it's really terribly isolating when you're actually, you know, shut in your room and that's where you get the meals served. But there are ways which we can actually allow people to safely congregate because just as that person was saying, you know, when you're, you know, just a phone call sometimes isn't enough. You want to be there with other people, have physically be together and, and finding ways for people in the community, again, to not only have regular contact, but figure out ways in which they can safely do things with other people, but obviously maintaining safety, like physically distant um, and making sure that we're doing things that really um, help people stay connected and, and not be forgotten. I want to play now a question from a viewer. Hi, I'm Susan from Armpur, Ontario. I have a mother in long-term care. I was wondering what, in your view, is the value of family caregivers in long-term care and retirement homes during this pandemic? And Dr. Sinha, first of all, for those of us who don't know, I mean, I can figure, I can sort of guess what a family caregiver is, but how, how does that work exactly, especially now during COVID? Yeah, so, you know, when we think about residents in long-term care homes, they often have two types of, if you will, visitors. Um, there are general visitors who might come by just for a social visit, but there are many people who aren't just visitors. They're what we call essential family caregivers. So people who come into a home um, who might be providing hands-on care, they might be providing mealtime support, or for people with dementia, just that socialization, that closeness can be so important to a person's health and well-being. So, you know, to Susan's question about how essential are these family caregivers, massively essential because the lack of contact between them, especially in older people with dementia and other things, we've seen significant increases in depression, loneliness, and just declines in health and well-being when they've been literally locked out of the homes while we've locked in um, older adults in these settings. 30 seconds to each of you, Dr. Abdul Rahman. I know you said we should call our moms, but beyond that, one last piece of advice. Whenever possible, if the rules are able to allow it, I mean, to have an in-person caregiver that's family increases that sense of familiarity. If you think about the richness of that relationship that you would have with family, you know, the value is equally as rich. And Dr. Sinha? Call and visit safely, but often. Great advice, simple advice, and uh, I know based on what you see every day in your practice, Dr. Samir Sinha, Director of Geriatrics at Sinai Health System, and Dr. Raymond Abdul Rahman, Clinical Psychologist, thanks to both of you. Thank you. And if you or someone you know is looking for resources to deal with loneliness or mental health, here are a few that the government recommends. Still ahead, celebrating seniors who beat the odds. The COVID-19 recovery parades, one long-term care home, was ha more than happy to organize. But first... We're going to perform that people should feel that life is going on. How Moscow's Bolshoi Theatre is dancing its way through the pandemic. We'll be right back. A beloved holiday classic opened its doors to the public in a different way tonight. For the first time in more than six decades, the Nutcracker from the National Ballet of Canada won't be performed live. Instead, you can watch it in some movie theaters or stream it at home. One of the most notable productions of that Russian ballet was at the iconic Bolshoi Theater in Moscow. Earlier, the pandemic had caused its doors to be closed, but even though COVID-19 remains all too present, Russia's treasured cultural venue is back in business. Chris Brown got a backstage pass. The setting looks like a real-life fairy tale. But inside Russia's majestic Bolshoi Theater, for the dress rehearsal the night before the gala, fantasy shares the stage with a cold, hard reality. The COVID pandemic isn't over. The performance commemorating the life of one of Russia's greatest dancers, Maya Plisetskaya, mesmerizes. But prima ballerina Yekaterina Shipulina is taking no chances. 
вечера в маске, так на сцену на спектакль снимаю. Екатерина Шиполина, who is 41, has danced everything from Swan Lake to Sleeping Beauty, and she's toured worldwide. But she says performing during this pandemic has been something no one could ever have trained for. It's a very difficult time uh, for everybody, especially for ballet dancer, uh, because uh, we can't work outside, online. Это безумно сложно, потому что, конечно же, мы поставлены в такие условия, в которых мы не можем соблюдать ни социальную дистанцию, мы должны снимать маски на сцену и быть с партнерами вот просто плечо к плечу. The Bolshoi is obviously one of Russia's most treasured cultural institutions, so much so that they've never missed performances, not during wars or revolutions, for 200 years, except for now, during the pandemic. In the spring, after 34 employees and dancers tested positive, authorities did the unthinkable and shut the Bolshoi. But with financial losses of $100,000 a day adding up, and the very future of the venue at risk. The decision was made in September to reopen. We are social, and without that, we can't do it. We can't be only careful and think about our lives. We need something more than ever. Because today is a very good presentation, and we hope, despite the difficult conditions of illness and weather, to get the pleasure and enjoy this experience. Audience members get their temperatures checked and wear a mask, although there's clearly lax enforcement, and seating is limited. It started at 50% capacity, dropping now to 25%. Still, the infections continue. 100 workers and artists are off now after testing positive, and even for this gala, three dancers had to be replaced at the last minute. 22-year-old Aliona Kovaleva, a rising star at the Bolshoi, lost out on a big role in a new ballet during the shutdown this spring, and she says no one wants to stop dancing again. We're supposed to have our premiere uh, with my partner in uh, last season, in May, but uh, then the quarantine started, and so, of course, all the plans were cancelled. <laughs> Of course, it was a disappointment, and uh, but for everyone, for everyone else, uh, we overstopped uh, and uh, thrown away from our usual world, from our lives, how we used to see them. The dancers get tested regularly, as does anyone who goes backstage. But she says she can't get comfortable dancing in a mask. That's very hard. I tried once, but I can't. <laughs> Nor, it seems, can the orchestra members either. They're all jammed together below the stage. This tribute to Maya Plisetskaya, who was born 95 years ago, danced at the Bolshoi into her 60s and died in 2015, is the highlight of the fall season, and its director was loath to cancel it. I know it's, it's dangerous. Andres Liepa told us celebrating Russian culture and the ballet is too important to be stopped by COVID. It's in our nature. You know, they're not saying, uh, and we're not saying, we're not going to come and we're going to sit at home. We're going to perform that people should feel that life is going on. And you know, if you close the theaters, if you close the uh, concerts, then people uh, feel more suffering just by not to having a chance to be in a part of the, the, uh, the nature and culture. There's a full slate of ballets over Christmas, including the classic The Nutcracker, but there's also nervousness. New cases of COVID-19 in Moscow are roughly 7,000 a day and still rising, so it's hard to know how long authorities will resist a new lockdown and keep the doors of this iconic venue open. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Still ahead, sharing stories about deaf people, made by deaf people. What a newly released film gets right about representation. But first.
this is a special edition of Metro Morning. CBC's annual food bank drive looked a whole lot different this year. Now, last year, we had the biggest crowd that we've ever seen. This year, Jill Dempsey and I are here alone on the we stage. Are. <laughs> the pandemic meant CBC studios across the country had to get creative. I love that I'm in your kitchens and living rooms. And even made house calls for the annual event. I'm going to do the ring. I rang the doorbell. Now I'm going to run away to my safe distance so we can safely distance. But even with the changes, listeners and viewers still managed to raise a record breaking amount of money from more than 400,000 and counting in Toronto to a whopping 1.5 million for local food banks here in Vancouver. The movie Sound of Metal, which opened in theaters last month and started streaming today, is a journey into the world of the deaf. Eli Glasner looks at the impact it's having beyond the screen. Mr. Stone, your hearing is deteriorating rapidly. In Sound of Metal, Riz Ahmed plays a musician who feels his life is over after learning he's going deaf. I'm deaf! For the actor, the role was an awakening. Not only the months he spent learning sign language, but also learning to see deafness as more than a disability. It's an identity, it's spelled with a capital D, and um, deaf pride is something that is real and rich and, and, and powerful. Um, it's another way of being. Chelsea Lee is a deaf actor who co-stars in the film. You were great. Speaking through an interpreter, she talked about what it feels like when Hollywood cast actors who've clearly not studied ASL. As a hearing person, you might not catch those nuances, but to have lived experience as a deaf person, it's hurtful to see that. For example, Julianne Moore plays a deaf woman. That was a no-no in the deaf community. It just doesn't, that doesn't work. Shares in the belief. Paul Racy plays a deaf teacher in the film. Raised by deaf parents, he's fluent in ASL and has many deaf acting friends looking for work. They're tired of being portrayed uh, falsely. They want to see themselves up there. We're looking for a solution to, to this, not this. What made Sound of Metal so refreshing for both of them is how it showed deaf characters with flaws, in this case, struggling with addiction. Their lack of hearing was the least of their problems. Absolutely, and so many times we see films that glorify the super deaf person or the hearing loss. But now programs like Deaf You on Netflix, This Close on CBC, shows about deaf people and made by deaf people are challenging those cliches. I'm an athlete. I'm a As a queer deaf actor, Lee says there's more to her than her lack of hearing. She wants to be hired for what she can do, not can't. What's your dream role? Um, Jim Carrey is my favorite actor. As a comedian and somebody who has physicality to his comedy, that's something that I would love to do. Monday. As for Riz Ahmed, he hopes the film can open doors. We have so much to learn, and the deaf community has so much to offer. A community starting to share its own stories. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Up next in our moment, a parade that isn't cancelled in 2020. How healthcare workers at a Winnipeg long-term care home are celebrating their senior COVID survivors. This is what some homes in the Toronto area put up in their windows as a way to thank healthcare workers. Neon hearts. And workers in Winnipeg are going above and beyond for their long-term care patients, putting on recovery parades for those who have fought COVID-19 and won. And that is tonight's moment. So we thought when uh, we had a resident that would be discharged from our COVID isolation unit that we wanted to celebrate. And we thought that a parade would be a great way to celebrate where the resident could participate, their family could participate. They feel um, very welcomed back to their home nursing units. They feel supported and loved by the staff. Um, and for a lot of them, it just is like really a sense of accomplishment that they've made it and they have survived. It's been a, a great morale booster for sure. Um, it gives staff the opportunity to celebrate, to uh, be hopeful, because I think hope is something that we all need right now. We wanted to be the, the bright light during a very dark time, and I think 
the parade is a great way of doing that. So we're just so happy to be able to do it. Celebration, hope, absolutely. We need more of that. And if you have some examples in your life of uh, situations where people are optimistic and hopeful during this time of COVID, please let us know. There are lots of moments to come. And any time we can find an excuse to play, although you couldn't hear that clearly, staying alive, I think that is a good thing. That is one of my personal goals, to get it on the show at least once a month. That is the National for December the 4th, and I hope you can join me Sunday afternoon for Cross Country Checkup on CBC Radio 1, and later that evening, back here on the National. Good night.